lounge and sun. Welcome back to the Comic Lounge. My name is Ryan, and with me today, I have one of my favorite cartoonists in the biz. I have Michael, Michael Avon Oming, and uh, you know him from Powers. You know him from all sorts of stuff, United States of, of Murder. Uh, you got a couple new books coming out, so it's a perfect time to talk. Um, I'm super stoked to have you on, dude. Welcome. Thanks, man. Thanks for having me on. I'm really excited to do this. Yeah, so, you know, I know we've talked over you know email before but you know every time i have somebody on the channel i always like to kind of do those like generic you know intro questions i always like to ask like how you first got into comic books as a fan um as a fan it had i mean i think a lot of people kind of got in comics this way was you know you you find yourself at a time in your your young life where you're on the outside of things <laughs> um and then you discover comics and that's where you go right yeah um and like i was born in texas and el paso um but left when I was very young for family in Jersey and we were up there. So it's basically a Jersey boy, but then around the third grade or uh, long story short, around the, the fifth grade, I moved back to Texas for a bit and I could not adjust, you know, and I had all kinds of Northern snobbery and I didn't want to, you know, assimilate in any way. And I resented everything. I had already had a huge chip on my shoulder, you know, um, just from other life stuff. Um, but luckily one day we went to this like flea market and there were these just a little bag of comics, you know, and, and at like web of Spider-Man and a couple other things. And at that point I was already drawing a little bit, you know, like all kids. And I just fell in love with the images that I saw and, you know, already through pop culture, even back in the eighties, there was bits of, you know, understanding what comics were in Spider-Man a, a little bit, you know, like electric company was a big Spider-Man thing for me. Right. Um, I had seen some comics here and there before that, but, being in that right mindset of like, you know, having shut the world out and having no friends, comics just flooded in. I just started tracing things immediately. Um, and that was it, you know, and I think probably about a year after my first comics is when I literally decided I wanted to be a comic book artist. And this is before I could really draw or anything. And I was like 12 and uh, that was it. I was on the path. Um, and it was a combination of ingesting comics and the drawing of it, you know, and really the drawing of it overtook the reading of it if that makes any sense you know okay, like i just yeah. all about the mechanism of comics even more so and there was lots that i read and lots that i enjoyed but it was definitely like ugh, i just fell under the spell of like how do these images and words come together and, and all of that yeah i mean it i mean comics are the best you know i i think obviously you know that because you, you work in comics um what were so what were some of the the most influential comics for you growing up and or creators I mean, Art Adams is why I'm a comic book artist. Um, I liked the books I was picking up just before that. There was like Web of Spider-Man, like I said, and Peter Spectacular, Peter Parker. And, you know, there was like, it was it was like old school Marvel house style at that point, you know, that sort of watered down John Buscema, but, you know, really functional and, and nice or whatever. And then we had moved back to Jersey and um, I was at a 7-Eleven. And this is what hurts is these days. You can't really, I mean, you can get comics at like your convenience stores, but it's just, you know, but but then it was monthly. You, you could just, if you got there in time, you got the monthly books. And it was X-Men Annual 9, mm -hmm. specifically X-Men Annual number 9, which is ironic because that also was partially worked on Partial Inks by Mike Mignola, who is the main influence on my work. Um, and like, I've been studying Mike's work since before he was doing what he does now, like way back in the early 80s. He did like these uh, Marvel fanfare issues of Namor and... Um, web of spider-man backup stories and just like these odds and ends stuff and his style was so outside of um the the marvel house style i didn't even understand what all of that meant at the time but i just was always attracted to his work so it's ironic he was an anchor for art adams now early on i just wanted to be arthur adams you know like uh looking at, at that the x-men annual nine it so blew my mind to the point that i didn't even understand what was going on in the comic um, because I hadn't really read X-Men. I had like a couple of issues. I wasn't really aware of the New Mutants and especially a character like Warlock who shapeshifts. So like at one point he turns into Starship Enterprise and I was like, why is there suddenly this, the Enterprise is in here? And like, you know, but all I knew was they were running around Asgard and it was all this cool Norse mythology stuff and these really cool outfits and Art Adams was drawing Storm as Thor and she was like throwing all these lightning bolts around and this kind of Walt Simonson who also became a big influence on me. Walt Simonson style, like there's that famous image of Storm holding up Molyneux and like, you know, all the, the blast coming off and he was doing this nice Walt Simonson homage and 
Um, all of the characters just captured me. And then shortly after that, New Mutants Annual 2 came out. And I'm not a person who can just rattle off issue numbers of books. I'm not one of those people who can do that. Um, but this is how impactful that these, these issues were on me. And this was inked by Terry Austin, another like unsung hero. It's, a, it's like a crime that Terry Austin isn't just mentioned at, at in every inker's lips like it should be like the first words that come out of their mouth mm -hmm. um but he he inked this issue which gave it this whole other look and again it was new mutants in asgard and all these other elements everything about it just sucked me in like it made me love the new mutants which then made me love bill sakevich's work um and of course chris chris claremont's writing at the time and and the whole scene that that that, that early 80s which then, you know, picking up trades of like, you know, classic X-Men, it ran into all of that and led me to all these other places. But it all started with X-Men Annual number nine and number two. And I just spent years just emulating Art Adams and just wanting to just be Arthur Adams and stuff. And he, he still will, like, while you don't see his work really directly influence my, in my stuff, it's, it's in the DNA. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, even in his work, like on uh, Fish Police and uh, um, Gumby. Gumby is one of my favorite things. <laughs> Yeah. Um, to this day, actually, I did in, in one of my um, Kickstarters um, for his book called The After Realm, which very much goes back to the X Men Annual Nine stuff. I did these paper cutouts, um, uh, like paper three D paper things. That was one of the one of the, uh, the, the reward tiers, and that was because in the back of Gumby, he drew all these like cave women, and you can cut them out, and they had like little bases on them and stuff, you know. Um, so you can cut them out and stand them up, which I never cut them out or anything. But I remember looking at that, just thinking how interactive and fun that was. So even to that level, like those early comics, and those early, those early formative days of, of ingesting um, Art Adams and Mignola um, specifically. And Bill Sienkiewicz weirdly is an influence on my work, which you couldn't quite see. But there's there's a sort of a psychological influence there, um, mm -hmm. his abstractness, the way he would interpret shapes to stand in for literal objects and stuff. You can see a lot of that in my, my work as well. Um, so th those were the things that really, really formed me was, was those two specific comics. And there's a sort of like uh, branches of, of things that came out of that, that, um, that formed even to this day, the, the stuff that I'm doing. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned Norse mythology. I mean, I think that that's evident in a lot of pro projects that you've done, you know? and. This is why I love asking this question too, because you're the first person that ever mentioned Gumby, you know, like to mention the Gumby comic by Art Adams, which I didn't even know existed up until like yeah. a year and a half ago. And that just blew my mind because I remember as a kid, like watching Gumby and stuff on TV yeah. and like, it's just such a weird concept of what that show was. And then like to find out Art Adams, like one of the greats drew yeah. a Gumby comic is just like, it's, it's insane. brilliant. It's yeah. brilliant. And Gumby was this a little side effect, side thing, but that's also a big influence on me. A lot of my stories go back to, like what was great about Gumby was how he would run in and out of books, right? So in one episode, he could be in three completely different trans-dimensional, pan-dimensional experiences, you know, from the mundane to, you know, being on the moon with aliens to being on Native Americans to then being in, a, you know, a big city and stuff like, like, just going in and out of the books and like like this idea of of an of an unending road is a big theme um to a lot of the stuff that i create um so it's interesting that again art adams was tied into that thing and these are all early influences that stayed with me to this day and again the after realm is about a character at the end of time who's just going in and out of all these different like broken shards of of, of time and place um so that goes back to gumby really like mm -hmm. yeah it's hilarious Art adams and gumby and, and mignola for me <laughs> so what was your first published book i i if i remember correctly you started at 14 right yeah um super early on yeah uh you know when i said i was like 12 and i decided that i wanted to be a comic book artist like that was li literally there wasn't any other path for me at that point um i had friends not many um i didn't really go out and do stuff like parties or whatever you know i actually found other local comic book artists uh, and a little bit later, one of those artists was um, Adam Hughes, who lived one town over from me. Mm -hmm. So I met him just while he was still working at a comic book store. He was just drawing the signs for the comic book store. And, and I remember being with him during his earliest tryouts for, for books, like just trying to get work and stuff. Um, so I found this other group of artists and that helped me stay 
hundred percent focused on comics um, to the point that like I was cutting school. Um, I also had like a, you know, your typical like kind of broken house childhood kind of stuff going on. So I was kind of raising myself and taking care of my mom. Mm -hmm. So uh, I was making my own hours. Um, so that's why at 14, I was able to get work done because I was, I was focusing on inking and brush techniques so early on when I was sending out work to get um, critiques from, from editors. Um, I, I got a job offer and it was from David Campiti, um, who's now known as a, as a, um, a rep for a lot of the South American artists and uh, an artist rep. Um, and he was running a company called Innovation and he hired me for um, a book called New Australia, um, which was one of Tim Truman's um, oh, okay. uh, creations. Uh, and yeah, that was my, my first thinking job. And I, and I, you know, I, it was funny. I didn't even know that I could kind of keep going, mm -hmm. um, but I guess it was good, you know, like, uh, because like I said, uh, raising myself and my mother, uh, I didn't, you know, pay attention to stuff like school as I should have, um, which became a problem later when, when work did dry up, because basically what happened was between 14 and 16, um, I just kept working and I got some minor things published after that. Um, but as at 16, I, I then with innovation again, I started working with them on child's play and that was my first inking regular inking work and one of the fun stories from there is uh Derek Robertson the, the um uh co-creator of the boys and uh worked on transmet and all this we had our first jobs together early on you know so we're about the same age have the same kind of drive and had this early book that we shared together which was uh which was really cool and basically yeah, from age 16 on that was it I was just working in, in comics as an anchor and you're completely self-taught then you didn't go to art school or anything yeah um we were just poor you know <laughs> um i mean you know and, and it's interesting and i don't want to get into too much of a, of a side thing but I, I thought about this a lot um you know when when you're poor there's this this low expectations that are put on you right um and it's like just stay out of trouble is good enough you know yeah. so nobody ever said to me at the, at school like you know you can you can go you can get a scholarship you know even if you don't have grades for it or whatever you can go to certain schools, they will see your talent. And there, there are ways to, to, to go forward. And nobody ever guided me for any of that. Um, but I guess it was just as well because I had this group of people um, that was my school. Um, a bunch of these other artists never quote, made it. I'm not sure if they were really trying to make it, but they just had the talent to know how to make comics and you get together every weekend or every other weekend and they taught me everything. Um, a little bit later on after meeting um, Adam, I met Neil Vokes, who was also a local in, in Jersey, and Rich Rankin. They were doing this comic book called uh, Eagle, uh, back in the black and white boom. Like their first issue sold like fifty thousand copies or something crazy, um, and they taught me a, a, a bunch as well. So I had all these mentors around me that that, that helped me um, make up for the lack of art school. But I also wish I did art school because there's, I don't know, cool stories. I guess I could have gotten from it as well as other kinds of knowledge and stuff. Well, I think like I mean. You know, I, I was mentioning my wife before we recorded, but like she's self-taught, you know, and I feel like when it's almost, I mean, your teachers basically were Art Adams, Mignola and Sienkiewicz. You just yeah. didn't see them in person, you know, but you were still able to analyze it with, you know, like in a way that not everybody can, because I think you have to have some artistic skill or the, the drive and the want, right? So you technically did, you just, you did it from home. You you did sure. art home, at home school, you know? Yeah. But, but I totally get that there's pros and cons to that too, right? Like there's like, if I had gone to art school, I'd have a deeper understanding of painting, a deeper understanding of color theory and uh, the things that just the, my circle of friends weren't particularly covering, right? But then there's also when, and I, I'm not sure musicians kind of feel the same way, is, is when you're self-taught, you're also not hindered by as many of the rules. Um, I think you're less intimidated as well, because I think once you're going to schools and stuff, I, I notice this a lot now. I, I sit in with Brian Bennis's class and my wife, Taki, they teach at PSU and um, they have these other classes. And um, I, I mean, I guess it works either way, but people are often intimidated feeling like they need to have this checklist of approvals to be an artist or to be a comic book artist or to be considered professional, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and maybe schooling kind of like, it's great for one thing, but maybe it also gives you this idea that you need permission or that you need to have this checklist thing um, and not having any of that and also just not having any sort of safety net of any kind. Um, it was like all or nothing, you know? Um, so 
I don't know. So there's, there's pros and cons for both. You know, I, I do admire my friends who have a deeper understanding of like art history and um, a deeper understanding of, uh, of color theory and, and uh, painters and all of that, which I think would serve me really well. Some of which I've tried to learn on my own, but obviously a schooling would have been um, more fun for that. I, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Always I, I get, I get <laughs> you. Um, so let's fast, let's jump forward a little bit. I mean, you mentioned Bendis, like you, you and him did one of my all time favorite comics in powers. And I think it holds such a special place in comic book history because I don't really think we ever saw a book done quite like that before, you know, like a crime noir with superheroes and it just from beginning to end, like it's like just one of the best. I wanted to ask, like, how did that kind of pairing with him come up? I know you, I mean, obviously you've done other projects with him as well, but how did that start? Uh, We had met at a comic book store signing um, really during uh, I had these ups and downs in my career, which, which I value a lot. Um, so just before I met Brian, like I did your typical comic book path, right? So I started as an anchor and it were these smaller jobs and the smaller jobs led to better jobs and the bigger jobs led to drawing. And it all led up to, I was a point where I was like 21 penciling and inking Judge Dredd for DC as a, like their flagship book for a bunch of these other stuff. Um, and also I, I wasn't quite ready for it. But, you know, I was struggling through it and you know, I lasted about five issues. And after that, I got work doing Foot Soldiers, which at that at, at, these, at Dark Horse with Jim Kruger, um, who had written, gone on to, to write like Earth X and a bunch of other really cool stuff at Marvel. And it did really well in that. Uh, you know, I started to really understand schedules and, you know, focusing and all of this stuff. And um, it wasn't too big of a job for me. Um, but then the industry basically collapsed. Um, it was that 90s speculation boom and like right. jobs just ended. You know, you couldn't really find any any more work and stuff. Um, so I was in this weird place and I was just trying to figure out what to do. And I started doing some creator own stuff just to generate work, just to make sure that I had something to do. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's when I met Brian and I clicked with him and it was him and David Mack I met at the same time. I just clicked with them immediately. I mean, David Mack and I at that, that night having just met, went to this after party, ended up wrestling in the backyard. So everybody else was like smoking weed or whatever. And except that wasn't our scene. And like, he gave me a black guy and, you know, it's just, and I'm not like, we're not like alpha male dude dudes or whatever, but you know, it just led to that thing, you know, just like a brotherly bond immediately. And with Brian, it, it wasn't physical, but it was the same kind of emotional brotherly bonding thing. And we just immediately started faxing each other work. And I said, I wanted to work with you. Cause like, I could just tell there was something in his writing and he was doing aka goldfish at the time and maybe the beginnings of jinx Mm -hmm. and um i knew and i wanted to go right into noir stuff like right into heavy um crime noir he saw what i was doing which was more um a genre science fictiony stuff and i did some pseudo superhero stuff for for dc at the time some backup stories and pinups um yeah and and so he sent me in a fax which is the old machine that used to get you know (laughs) Uh, this idea for powers and at first I, I was like ah i don't think so because it has superheroes in it i just wasn't interested in superheroes and then he had the this is how new this this whole combination of these ideas were at the time um and you only had hints of this kind of thing slightly before that with like marvels and uh and watchmen a bit in the different mixtures right but like he he really boiled it down to a detective's point of view in a murder a real detective's point of view in a murder and really treating it as homicide or NYT PD blue, you know, and not leaning into the superhero stuff, which we did later in the series, but we only did that after we had done three, four years of just this hardcore point of view detective work. Mm-hmm. Um, and thankfully, yeah, I said, yeah, this just makes sense. And um, long story short, it's just been a dream come true. Um, I turned 50 recently and I was looking back on looking back and forward at the same time. I was looking back at everything that I've done and thinking about what do I wish I'd, I have done more of um, and looking forward and stuff. And what, what's interesting was Powers is everything I've ever, ever wanted from a comic or my career. Um, the other really big influence on me besides Mignola and R. Adams was uh, Steve Rude's and Mike Barron's uh, Nexus. Yeah. Um, and I didn't even understand what a creator-owned book was for a very, for a very long time. But all the stuff that I really admired, like like Nexus and later Hellboy and further on, there's a bunch of books from first that are all kind of slipping my mind. Um, 
Frank Miller's Sin City and like just the, all the all the creator owned stuff that was happening, uh, Love and Rockets. I don't think I ever set out to do that sort of thing, but at some point it started to come together. And like, yes, yeah, so I realized, yeah, Powers was like literally everything I ever wanted um, because I wasn't looking to be at the top 10 at, at Marvel in DC as a, as a writer or artist. Of course, that's super cool. And of course, you know, I, I took those opportunities to, to work there and, 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 and um, those are important to me, right? But realizing that, I, wow, I accidentally, like, I stumbled into the dream of what I really, really wanted to do. And, and it was to create something that uh, I could make a living off of, that is lasting, that has left its mark in comics. Um, I'm incredibly grateful for it. And, and um, just, it's, it's a whole mind blowing experience. I still have trouble wrapping my head around it, that, that it's happened, you know? Um, so I'm not sure if that answers your question. But I'm just no, incredibly... no, de no, definitely. I mean, like I said, it's one of my favorites, and I feel like it's it's such a, it's so timeless. You know, like you can pick it up at any point. It still feels like fresh to me. Like I, I think I did a video maybe sometime in the last year with a buddy of mine where we we talked about like the the image era before you guys moved it over to Marvel, um, and it's just like just consistently good. You know, and it's it's rare that you get a series that go especially a creator on that goes long like sometimes you only get like one trade worth right That's, like yeah. it's just hard to sustain um mm -hmm. and, and we did have some trouble like i had trouble focusing to be honest for as grateful as i was for, for his dream to come true and i was still a younger person then so like powers open up other opportunities so sometimes my attention was split and that's one of the things looking back that i regret was that there wasn't literally more you know um like i'm so in awe of um like uh, Brew Baker and Phillips's uh, crime books, you know, they've monthly just consistently hammered to put those out. Same thing with the Walking Dead books. Like they, you know, Charlie Adler never got distracted. He just stayed right on there. And boom, boom, boom. Um, and we were fairly consistent, but I just wish we had done more of that. You know, I wish we had even more uh, of power stories. Not to say that we've left anything unsaid. Like I think we've, you know, because we we're able to bring everything full circle. I think we ultimately said everything we needed to, but like one of the things looking back is like, yeah, I do wish, you know, yeah, I, I, I do wish I had the maturity to be a little more focused, you know, but I'm, I'm an art slut. And I get so excited by ideas and I just want to do more and more and more. Uh, yeah. I mean, I'm sure it opens up a lot of opportunities, like you said, for yourself with the success of that book, you know, I mean, I know somewhere in the middle there, you worked with Kevin Smith on that blunt man and chronic and, yeah, <laughs> you know, so like that, that too is awesome. I think I, I think I discovered that before I discovered powers because like I'm a huge Kevin Smith head. So like I saw that comic and yeah. I, I just loved your art. I'm like, Oh, what else did he oh, do? Thank you. That was so fun. How did that, I, I kind of like, I know I kind of sidestepped out of powers, but how did that come up? How did the project with it that? was, it was because of powers. And I think it was literally because of uh, a man named Bob Chapman, Bob, Bob Chapman, um, Bob Chapman ran graffiti um press um which was largely shirts you know they, they did most of the, of the commercialized shirts that you would have seen at the con circuits in the early 2000s and maybe longer and before i don't know the full history but he was really important and sometimes he dabbled in, in publishing and he was helping kevin smith publish um blunt man and chronic and he had known me from the powers that just happened we had just done like a shirt or some business and he was a, just a really nice guy and he showed Kevin my work and Kevin was like, oh, all right, another Jersey boy, all right, awesome. Um, and then it was just a lot of fun. It was a lot, a lot of fun. Um, and I think the one of the things that sticks out in my, my head for all the crazy stuff that was in there, um, I did a shot where they were peeing in a urinal and I, without showing any of the naughty bits, I was able to do the view from inside the urinal. It was sort of like the dirty version of that that cover of, of Punisher where you're inside the mouth and there's the teeth and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But from a urinal, I was very proud. I was like, I bet nobody else has drawn this before. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I've seen that before or after, definitely. <laughs> um, so okay, so let's get let's uh I want to jump right back in. So, like like I said, you've worked with Bendis on a lot of projects. Um, is there anything any plans to I, I know you said you've kind of said all you had to say about powers, but is there any other collabs that you and him might possibly oh. be working on? Definitely. Um, outside of, of Powers, our, our first thing that we did at, at um, during Powers was um, United States of Murder, Inc., mm -hmm. which we're, sh we finally given it in and we're shortening that just, just down to Murder, Inc. Uh, so there's a new trade of that coming out through Dark Horse that we're very excited about. Um, uh, there's some unpublished work because it kind of happened between the shifting between uh, 
Marvel and DC and DC to Dark Horse. Mm-hmm. Um, so super excited about that. It's it's honestly our, our favorite thing outside of Powers. We've done several things. There's Takio. Takio is also like a, a YA thing, very close to us because it has to do with, uh, it was an idea by his daughter about his daughter team up with my wife, hence <laughs> Taki O, or my wife's Taki, and her, her name is Olivia. And um, we had so much fun on that. And currently, while we're waiting for the, this this big arc of, of Murder, Inc. to come out, uh, and, and very quickly, Murder, Inc. is what if the FBI never took down the the, the mafia during the 80s and 70s? Um, and what would that look like? And ironically, it's a lot like it is right now. <laughs> yeah. Um, in, a, in a different way it's it, reality is hard to keep up with man it really is but we're working on a new project right now I've got I just finished the second issue and it's not announced yet of course uh, but um, Taki is coloring it and it's a pseudoscience fiction story uh, well it is a science fiction story I think that's all I could say for now all right well I'm, I'm but, yeah, super we're, we're stoked hardcore working on it you know and again we're having trouble keeping up with reality because science and um, this has a bit to do with uh, journalism. It's all hard to keep up with. Uh, things are, are changing all the time. Yeah, it's, you know what I think is really interesting is that all the Jinx World stuff has now been published by basically every publisher, right? Image, yeah. Marvel, <laughs> DC, and Dark Horse. I think that's pretty crazy to see that it's creator owned, but that it's been with every publisher. Is it yeah, true? yeah. Also, a shout out to our lawyer. Now this sounds funny, but there's a reason I'm mentioning this, and I want I want this to really sink into the other creators out there and anybody else listening who's looking into um, whether you're writing or you're creating something, um, is to have contracts to protect yourself. Now the reason I'm bringing that up because you said we've been at every major publisher, and uh, as a property, Powers has been at Sony, FX, it's been with PlayStation. Um, there's been some other uh, studios in between there, and during that whole time, we've never lost our rights uh we've never had a falling out um we've always been protected and that's because not only do we have good lawyers who are looking out for us but we just made sure that we had agreements along the way for everything so there was never a chance for brian and i to have oh wait you're getting this and i'm not getting that you know because nothing was ever a surprise we would talk you know sometimes the conversations weren't always comfortable because like sometimes they want brian more for something else but then brian always looked out to make sure that like i'm being mentioned and every press release, he also made sure that like, when we were in production on Powers, now we're leaning heavily on him. They're like, look, Mike is this tool that you can, you can, you should utilize as well. And he found little ways for me to get in. And then once I was able to prove myself, next thing on the second season of Powers, I'm designing costumes and stuff. Um, so you're looking out for each other, but, but the legal stuff, it protects you. You know, um, it, it always makes me sad when you hear of a, a, of a story of like, somebody made a film deal and then that's it, they've lost their rights. Um, they might have their publishing rights, but then, or maybe they don't even have their publishing rights anymore. I've seen that just disappear on people. Um, so long story short, when, you, when you're talking about how we've been everywhere, um, it's it's another important reason why you need to, um, you'd be serious about your, your contract stuff. It's to protect yourself and to make your relationships comfortable. Yeah, Brian, I mean, I've outside... never sued each other. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, outside looking in, I mean, just the entire Jinx World catalog, everything like that, you know, watching it move around, like I just look, I'm like, Man, they're that's that's business smarts right there. Whatever they're doing behind the scenes that I don't know and that we all don't know, like something something right's going on there. So it's interesting to hear you say that, you know, like to and how looking out for each other. I think that that's super important too. You know, not burning bridges, making sure you're taking care of, uh, making sure you're taking care of each other. I think that that's I don't know. The comic industry to me is just a yeah. very beautiful thing when it works. You know, obviously yeah. there's history, there's things where it doesn't go right, but I think that. History also shows the generations moving forward what to do and how to do it, like you just said, and you know, mentioning that and for anybody yeah. listening and watching and future generations, like they know, like look out for yourself, yeah. you know. And that stuff's hard. It's a it, it can be expensive, you know, or you know, it is something you really have to think about investing in. Lawyers aren't cheap. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, the alternative of of falling out and losing your rights and stuff like that is, is much worse. Um also just on like the the rumor side of things, when people read headlines about teams falling out or seemingly somebody screwing somebody else over and stuff, you have to remember there's a lot behind the scenes that that just don't make it into the press. Things right. aren't always the way that they quite seem or there's more context that never make the, the stories and stuff. Um, 
And I'm only saying because I've seen it happen with other when I hear some of the stories that I was judgmental about, I go, oh, I, you know, that stuff wasn't public and this thing happened behind the scenes, or sometimes bad choices are left out of your hands and stuff. And um, uh, you know, and I'm only saying it because like creators are targets all the time. You know, there are days I wake up where somebody tells me, your art fucking sucks. You know, you ruined my comic by having your art in it or something, right? Jesus. Um <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's, you know, you're a public figure and stuff. So we get yeah. attacked enough. And like, I, I hate when we see like infighting or sort of rumors about how somebody said this or did that stuff. I think uh, we need to look out for each other, you know, kind of like, the, you know, the, the old saying, your mother says like, uh, you have nothing nice to say, don't say anything at all, kind of, because you know, we don't always know what's going on behind the scenes and stuff. Yeah, I mean, that's my attitude with my channel, you know, like I'm sure if I started spewing more hateful videos or doing yeah. that to get clicks like i'm sure i could get more but it's like i didn't i started this to, for the love of comics and I, I agree i think everybody should just look out for each other and if you don't have something i say hey take your phone off the phone or the tablet or the keyboard and just yep. be quiet you know like don't yeah don't just share that i don't think it's important it just it just spreads it that's why twitter for me it's like i know it's a necessary evil in terms of like yeah. marketing yourself but i that's totally. like the one I'm on the least, you know, because it's like yeah. you go on there and you just see the hate. I'm like, I don't need that. I don't need to be a part of it. Like, yeah, my I'll Twitter feed your... is obnoxious because it's just me promoting my stuff or retweeting things that I like. That's, you know, uh, <laughs> that's me yeah. too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's 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 all you need. Yeah, exactly. Well, let's uh, let's talk. Let's go into some more positive stuff. So, over the past couple yeah. of years, you've been working on, like you mentioned, your fantasy book, uh, After Realm, which I, you know, I. Oh, I've only read the first issue because I keep missing the Kickstarters for some reason. Um, but no I I loved the first issue. I love fantasy books. There's not a lot of them, you know. Yeah. Um. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the book and then also your choice to do it through Kickstarter. Um. Well, the industry is a weird place, you know. Um. And and there's an interesting problem right now of that they're the the market is flooded with great comics. And it's hard to just get space out there. So um, when I saw the, how Kickstarter was growing, um, I wanted to experiment and I was trying to do kind of both things. I was thinking, well, um, you don't need huge numbers on Kickstarter to, um, to be successful. And so I was trying to launch and I have a, a market in, in the direct market, you know, of, of an audience there. So I was trying to split the difference and to, to have both my Kickstarter going with the, the image comic at the same time. And unfortunately, I think I just sort of split and confuse the audience. Um, so eventually the book just became a, a Kickstarter book, um, which has been incredibly rewarding on a very different level. It's a smaller audience, but the interaction is much more personal and intense. And um, instead of people just going like, oh, that issue was cool, or that was neat. You know, you get like actual questions about like the characters and the world because people are just more invested. Uh, so I really have enjoyed that and, and basically that was just my playground, um, the After Realm. The After Realm is something I'm hoping to just keep around so that I can tell any kind of story. It's the Gumby thing. So yeah. it's, it takes place after Ragnarok. And I've always had this idea that at the end of time, you know, uh, you know, time is a flat circle kind of thing, you know, like things are all happening at the same time. We just kind of put them together in our heads so that we can understand them. Um, so at the end, after Ragnarok, the elves send out a few rangers to remap the world to see what happened to the old gods and stuff. And um, it was a great way for me to explore mythology stories and to pop around different cultures of time and um, have these adventures. And then eventually I figured out instead of the character really, in, really uh, just investigating old mythologies, but what if she's investigating what's left of us? So you take an elf investigating modern mythologies you know what does america look like after it's been destroyed what what's left over of the spirit of america and stuff and some of it's critical and some of it's fun um and uh yeah so that's the the after realms we did five issues of that through kickstarter the, the last one just happened i'm going to do the trade soon i'm not sure if i want to do that um as a kickstarter or or with a publisher yet um because kickstarters were as awesome they are it's a lot of work yeah yeah definitely <laughs> i mean i I bet. I mean, you're packing them yourself, right? Unless you're doing it through. Uh, no, like... I, had to, I had to get help. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I totally agree, though. The 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 community, I like Kickstarter for supporting uh, creators in terms of like, first of all, you get extra perks, right? Like you, yeah. there's always getting original art, there's getting commissions, and then you feel like you're directly supporting. Like 
I guess Kickstarter is kind of the middleman. Like I know obviously they take a little bit of a cut, but it just feels like you're directly like, I believe in you. I love your work. Absolutely. I want to support you. And I think that that's Absolutely. like the beauty of the, of the crowd. Yeah. And I've built up some social media friendships over it. There, there are people who just, you know, at first they're supporting your work, but then, you know, you'll see that, uh, you know, they're having a health problem and you just wish them well and stuff, or, you know, you're talking about how it's a, it's a tough day or something and they'll reach out and like, you start you know, building up little friendships and stuff too. It's, it's really cool. Yeah. I know you said you're working on the trade, but is there a way for people to get any of the available issues? Do you have any available if people want to buy them? Uh, not right now. Um, okay. I was asking yeah, that's myself to be now. honest with you, but I was also <laughs> curious for other people too. Uh, yeah, because you kind of print to order, you know, okay. so there's just not tons of, of copies. I have, I've, you know, I'm, I'm going to do a, a signing at Cosmic Monkey um, February 22nd for the release of Blue Book. Um, and I'll bring some extra books, but there'll be odds and ends. It won't be the full run. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so I'll, I'll grab some for you. But uh, um, yeah, that's what I'm trying to figure out the best way to do the the, the trade paperback. Um, and there's also this challenge of the kickstarters i did for after realm were, were like 48 page uh stories but shipping out a 48 page book and yeah shipping out a, a big trade economically is a, is a whole other hurdle so i'm just not i don't know if i'm ready for the the psychological pressure of that mm-hmm. <laughs> so yeah we're gonna figure out how, how we're but we'll be we're releasing that and i'm doing occasionally i'm kind of shifting the focus of that because of my, my current workload yeah um my future after realm stories are going to be um short stories about five pages each that i'm releasing through my um my newsletter or my patreon um the patreon is just a, a larger high res thing my patreon's a dollar a month um but I'm, that's how you, basically they'll be the stories from now on are going to be free until i really figure out in the future what i want to do with after realm and maybe it'll always be free maybe it'll always just be in, in my um my newsletter because it's just a it's just a it's a passion project it's a work of love it doesn't have to be anything but stories that make me happy, you know, Um, because when you're doing your typical comics, whether it's Murder, Inc. or Takio or Murder, Inc. or the new thing with Brian, I have to think about marketing. I have to think about who the audience is. I have to think about how it's being released. Um, So it's neat to have something where it's, it's literally just for me and I can just um, not worry about how I want to release it, you know? Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, I I love that. I mean, it definitely came out like when and the stories I read of the book, you know, like your love for it. You know, like it 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 feels like you're enjoying yourself. Like it comes off of the page, you know, definitely. Thank you. Um, thank you. That's that's yeah. exactly what it's meant to be. So it's my own little playground. Yeah, dude. Um, uh, I wanted to ask though, like writing and drawing, like you've done both. I mean, I we don't have to get into it, but like one of my favorite books of yours is one you didn't even draw, you wrote, which was the Aries miniseries way back. Oh, like yeah. I've read that so many times you know like Ah. just like for some there's something about it that i just i really love especially like the father-son relationship aspect of it amazing um thank you but i wanted to ask you how you approach your work differently as when you're writing or when you're drawing and especially in terms of when you're doing both on the project i mean the the, first of all thank you on on aries i really appreciate that that's that's I'm, i'm highly critical of my own work you know um, and that's one of the ones that I'm still um, pretty proud of. Um, and, and it was successful, you know, and that feels good too. Sometimes you do stuff you're proud of and nobody really sees or it's just, you know, it disappears. Uh, so thank you on that. Um, the big difference between writing for yourself and writing for somebody else is um, like on After Realm, my writing is so loose. Basically, I write out the, the plot and then I just keep expanding the plot until it's maybe like a page long. And then I go into each paragraph and just figuring out how many sentences equal to a page. Um, and it's not like, oh, three sentence make a page. So you have to pay attention to what's in this sentence, like how many actions are happening. Um, and then I'll write out the pages. From there, I don't have any dialogue. I'll just start laying it out. As I'm laying it out, I'm still kind of writing in my head as an artist writer. So things can change from there even. Um, and then the dialogue becomes very last. It's such a messy process because sometimes I'm not always sure, well, why did I draw this? Like, especially if I had to take a long break because of, you know, paying work or something, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but it's a really fun, I hate when art, artists and writers talk about organic process because that's a way of not answering a question, but really it's super organic. Like it, it just kind of tells, like I find the page as I'm doing it, um, the, the pacing tells me what's coming next. Um, so it's it's very instinct instinctive. 
when I'm writing for somebody else, it's the exact opposite. You know, I have to be descriptive, but not too descriptive. I have to be clear, but, um, but, but not burdensome with information. And, uh, I took a break from writing for, for a long time and I kind of lost my passion for it. And then I spent several years kind of rebuilding and re-understanding um, writing. Um, and, and a big part of that was with Taki, um, my wife. She, we both love stories. And then um, she started writing a graphic novel, a biography um, about two years ago called Sleeping While Standing, which is out now through, through Avery Hill. And she wanted to tell her own biography through these short vignettes and, um, each one is just four pages. So she had to have the discipline, no matter how complex, how deep, how dark or funny the story was, to tell it in four pages. And through that process, she learned this sort of um, very harsh editorial, what is the spine of the story? What am I saying? What does this character want? What is the point of this? And take away everything else, like a flamethrower, you know? Um, and through that, through watching her learn that process, it helped me become a much clearer writer as well. So I'm actually back into writing now um, for other people. Um, there's some stuff that's not been announced yet. Um, I have a new project with Dark Horse that I'm writing and drawing, but because I'm working with editors on these, I'm writing them as if I'm not drawing them. So I'm being as clear as possible in the, these scripts. So those are the big differences really is when you're writing for yourself, you can be looser when you're writing for others and companies like Marvel, DC or Dark Horse, you have to, you have to be clear, but also not burdensome with, with detail and uh, repetitiveness, which was a big problem that I had. Now, do you think, I know you say you, you can be very critical of yourself and your work, but do you think that being an artist first made you a better writer in terms of, especially writing for comics? Yeah, um, for especially for writing for comics. Um, it wouldn't make me a better writer outside of that. Um, whether I'm writing an email? Yeah, no, I mean, writing. you know, like, I mean, especially because, like, you know, as an artist, when you're, you know, like, maybe a writer is, like, too kind of, like, strict in terms of what they want to see on the page and they don't let that. Yeah. Because, I mean, I see that all the time, like, where, like, or I've heard it, where artists feel like, oh, they just you know, there's no room for me to put myself in it. So that's why I meant like, you know, sure. do you think it made you a better writer when writing for another artist? Cause you're like, you don't do what you don't like. If you, I, yeah, I definitely sense. do think it, it's specifically for comics because I, like I've, I've worked with non artist writers or great writers, but they could be burdensome on minutia. Um, Cause they're so trying to explain what's in their head. Um, and then through, through no fault of their own, like they're trying to communicate with the artists. Sometimes it's, it's almost like, I don't mean this in a sexual way, but like fetishy, you know, like, like whether it's a fetishy of the genre, you know, so they want to get into the minutia of like the compute, how a computer works or how a sword works or the, 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 the way this car is put together um, or how a superhero power works or something. Um, and I, I definitely find that working with like um, or Brian or other writers who, who are artists, they know how much room to, to, to give. Um, now, that being said, I have worked with other writers like um, Greg Rucka. I, I did a story with him on um, Old Guard, and he wrote like an artist. Like, he left so much open. Like, he gave me just what was needed, just the information that was needed. It, it may be because he knew me enough to sort of trust me. But long story short, yeah, I do. Yeah, I think those are the reasons why um, it helps me there. It doesn't help me in other aspects of writing, like an email or a proposal or... Um, uh, if I have to write an article or something like that, that stuff, then I'm at a loss. Then I wish I was cool, a real writer. <laughs> I, I, I totally, can bridge the gap. Yeah, I totally you know, get, I get that. I totally, <laughs> totally get that. Okay. Um, so I want, let's get into this new project that you're doing, the Blue Book. I mean, you've already worked on it. Obviously, it was through Substack first, uh, but it's about to drop. I think it, this upcoming week, if I remember correctly, I think the 22nd. February 22nd. Yeah, February twenty yeah. second. So, uh, how did that project with James Tinian? Um, how did that project come up? I mean, I I love the concept. I, I've been waiting for it to be in print. Once I knew it was going to print, I just something about the tactileness of it. I just it's hard for me to read online. Um, but it depicts true stories of UFO encounters. I love yeah. that so much. Like I I'm super into UFO. So, um, how did that project come about with him? Um. So I've always been into weird and fringe stuff. Like it's just, you know, I grew up 
uh, watching reruns of like uh, In Search of Leonard Nimoy did the the mm -hmm. narration yeah. on. Um, of course, later on there was like X Files. My family always told like ghost stories. My mother had a had a sighting at one point. I've never seen really anything, but I've known people who have, so that those things leave an impression on you. Um, I've always just loved weird and conspiratorial things. And um, James has a book out called uh, the, the Department of Truth. Yes. And what I loved about this was he basically figured out how to do the X-Files without doing the X-Files. Ever since the X-Files, there's been so many attempts to capture what that show caught. Um, but it was either an imitation. I think maybe the closest you ever got was like that show Fringe um, for a while was, was pretty close. Um, to capture that sense of like wonderment, um, but in an updated version of it. Um, and James somehow was able to do that in Department of Truth. And uh, we had, I wouldn't say we were Twitter friends, but we just aware of each other on Twitter. Um, luckily, being around for a really long time, there's a new generation of, of writers and artists who grew up liking powers. So they're already familiar with me. So if I liked somebody's work, like James, I reached out to him and said, oh man, I love this book. And it's like, hey, you want to do a cover? So we just started talking. Um, then when he had the Substack deal, he reached out to me with this idea of doing Blue Book. And it's the kind of thing, like the second he said it, I knew what it was in my head and it was exactly what he had already thought of. You know, so part of it was generational, like that, that we had a lot of the same influences, which I didn't find out till later, um, a lot of the same interests. But as soon as we said, let's do like a journalistic look at Project Blue Book without um, creating any new fantasy around it or injecting any of our own ideas, and just do almost like a journalist comic. Um, the, the look of it came through right away. I mean, obviously it's called Blue Book, so that, that's like the first thing come, oh, let's do it in blue tones, right? Yeah, I love and it. Darwin Cook had done such a beautiful job at that on Parker. There was already this sort of like roadmap towards it. Um, and uh, I also love the idea of having to tell a visual story without leaning on the conventions of comic books. There's no punching, there's no explosions. There's nobody leaping through glass windows. Um, it's, it's pure, pure storytelling. Like I have to tell the story through emotions, through body language, and, and sometimes without even sequential movements because some of it is journalistic. So it's just a shot of books or it's just a shot of the building. And then that next shot isn't sequential either because it's being told in this journalistic sense. So it's this back and forth language be between the two things. All of that just immediately came to both of our heads at the same time. It was it was true kismet. It was like lightning strikes. It was like when, almost like when Brian and I came up with powers because I, I was slightly resistant to that at first. But as soon as I got it, we were all on the same page. So it was one of these rare things that happened um, and really exciting. And I'm very passionate about it. Like it's a, it's a subject that I love and I can live in all day. I listen to UFO podcasts all the time. What's going on right now with the balloons is funny and crazy and weird and um all the recent news around the uap stuff and all this kind of you know weirdness um also history seems to be repeating itself because as i'm doing blue book so much of what's going on now was already done in the 50s we already had these investigations by the government they always start out with oh this might be this thing and then they backtrack and say it's not this thing and i, I think a lot of it has to do with just using um information to help keep really mundane secrets you know um so there's just a lot of smoke and mirrors mm -hmm. there is true conspiracy around it because it's there to like like we know now that cia had definitely used um ufo stories to help keep um secret uh planes and stuff like that um uh a secret you know because if you saw the i forget the names of the experimental airplanes coming out of area 51 back in the 80s uh, UFO um, BS story was a great cover up for for that kind of stuff, you know. Um, so it's it's really interesting. Like there's just all these like weird truisms mixed with people's observations, mixed with folklore, mixed with larger craziness, and it all comes together in this beautiful soup that's Blue Book and that whole um, phenomenon. Yeah, I mean, I think it's just like I said, it's such a great concept, and I love that you called out Darwin's Parker books because I kind of got that feeling when I first saw it. And I was going to yeah. ask you if it's going to be the blue tones the entire time. And that's just such a, it's such a cool idea to do that for that book. Um, I want to ask though. Uh, so do you believe in UFOs? That's a weird question. Um, <laughs> it's a weird question because I, I remember 
somebody asked me that one point and just getting stuck because I've been so entrenched in, I don't want to, sound like I'm backing away from it to say, oh, I'm better than people who believe or whatever. But I didn't realize kind of like comic books, I was so into the mechanism of it. I was so into um, the, the psychology and the reports and how those stories change over the years. I was just so invested and interested in the whole field. I never, it took me a really long time to actually ask myself, do I actually believe that aliens are visiting from other planets or yes or no? Um, and I have a really crappy uh, fence sitting answer which is I think that the universe is way weirder than we think it is I think it's weirder than aliens visiting us in nuts and bolts machines or light rays or something like that like I think what what could be happening is just much stranger than that because um, you know the universe is the universe it's way bigger and also way smaller on a quantum level as we're learning um, than we could ever imagine and who knows what any of this stuff is it seems to change with time um, the way UFO um, abductions and um, sightings and ships, they, they always change with the times that they're in, which says like either it's purely psychological thing or that it somehow taps into our consciousness to present itself in context with the times. Um, nobody talks about a ship landing with landing gears anymore. Right. When was the last time you heard of that? When was the last time you heard of, of a ship where you could see bolts on it? That was in all of these ex, uh, all of these reports in the fifties and sixties. Um, even the way that that like Betty and Barney Hill was the first story that we that we cover. And by the way, I, I believe their experience of the story things were very different. There were landing gears, there were um, bolts. I think even the aliens were were different than they evolved into later on and stuff. Um, if I had to go out and give you my true belief on it, it's very what they call woo, um, which I think we just, I think we live in a, in a consciousness based universe where I, I think our consciousness has a lot to do with, with what, what, what people are experiencing. Cause while I've never experienced these things and I've gone out and I tried to, I know people who have, and I, I don't have any reason to disbelieve what they've seen or what they've experienced. Um, but it, there's also no context in which it's consistent in. Right. So, you know, uh, it seems it's got to be some sort of like the way we observe time and thought in the universe, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> it's a way better answer than I, I thought, like I could have <laughs> thought of. So, yeah, I mean, I, I definitely think, uh, I mean, I feel like I may have had an experience, but I, I don't know for sure. It was just, but mine was just light, you know, like, and I was with my wife. We both saw it. You know, and mm -hmm. the way it moved in the sky, I've never seen some move like that. But was it? I don't know. You know, I just sure, know that it was yeah. a fucking really weird experience. And I've never how long did it last? Before. The experience less than a minute. It was very the light moved very fast. You know, and it See, was that's, and that's the weird thing too. When when you you have a very quick experience, you're you're instantly rebuilding it in your head. You know, um, like the closest we've had as we we've we've seen a couple of. You're looking at a star and then it just gets really, really bright and then it disappears. Mm -hmm. um, but it happens so quickly that as you're rebuilding in your head, you're already sort of patching in memory stuff and you already started to rebuild it. And you're already like questioning, well, did I really see that? And it's, is that how it happened? Or now was it just a play of the, the atmosphere and stuff? And like, you know, so it immediately starts to, to, to get loose from you, um, which is why people have longer experiences are, are those are really fascinating to me because yeah. It, those become harder to question right um, right right definitely yeah uh so what's the what's the plan for the book i know this initial one is five issues but are there <laughs> plans for more for you guys to do yeah our first story is as betty and barney hill um which is like sort of the, the kicks it sort of kicks off the modern day observations and and uh, definitions of what ufo abductions are or um that whole experience um and that's about 100 pages I absolutely love the story. I started to fall in love with the characters, both as characters and who they were in real life because they're of my parents' generation. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot in there that I could identify with and, and um, I hope we did them justice. Um, after that, we're, we're going into the very first uh, flying saucer. And I said it in quotes because it wasn't a saucer shape. It, it moved like a saucer going across water, which was Kenneth Arnold's sighting um, between Mount Rainier and Mount Hood. Um, uh, and that gets interesting because there's weird stuff in there where 
you start getting into pseudo government cover up involvement stories because everybody in the 50s was involved, you know, in World War Two. Mm-hmm. So half of them were involved in military intelligence and um, and the programs that came out of the military. So you start getting these weird crossovers like there's this cat named uh, Fred Krins- Crisman, who was involved in the Maury Island incident, which happened shortly after the Kenneth Arnold sighting and he was investigating. And then that dude ended up being entangled in the JFK assassination, where he was rounded up with what's called the three hobos, which were these these suspects. Um, but they were clearly a plant. They, they weren't really suspects and they weren't really hobos and stuff. And like it just immediately starts getting weird, you know, and, and, and this and that story also starts out with um, somebody faking UFO uh, um, crashes. But then the, the investigators would go and investigate it. Um, their plane blows up, um, you know, so it's all these sort of weird, the thing that drives me crazy in, in the, the, in this field that I love, um, is that many people want to say, and they truly believe that there are no coincidences, right? Now there's a philosophical belief that things happen for a reason, but to say that there's no coincidences is going to drive you down a rabbit hole of insanity. And I see that all the time. I see it as I'm drawing it. Um, right now in the in the blue book story there are these three guys who look so much alike who are involved in these stories that it's kind of insane and I'm having trouble even differentiating them on the page um, and that then gets into it there's all, I won't even get into it there's so many weird conspiracy theories out there and stuff but you know there there are so many quinces like these guys just looking like carbon copies of each other um, involved in these stories like uh, that's just a coincidence, but believe me, in the UFO community, people are going to say, oh, there are no coincidences, so what does this mean? You know, and then they get into the symbology stuff or numerology stuff or how the Illuminati is using these particular, you know, um, images or instances, and, and it's just, you know, it's it's fascinating, and then I don't say it in an eye-rolling way, like, I am fascinated by it. I'm, I'm oh, fascinated same. by the psychology of it, like, the, the need for humans to connect things together that are disconnected. And that makes this whole thing of, of the investigating UFOs and, and the history behind it more and more difficult. Yeah, I mean, I'm super fascinated by all that stuff. I mean, my wife constantly will look for connections where she sees like three numbers in a row, you know, she'll be like, what does that mean? And then she'll be like, oh, look, see how it's yeah. connected. And I'm like, and sometimes I'm some, that, sometimes I'm I roll my system. eye. But she's usually sometimes she's right. So it's like I, I used to question it, but then when she started becoming right with it, and like I'm yeah. like, okay, that's that's weird. You know, like that's well, that's why that I'm not happens. dismissive of it of right. it either, because not that it quote really means something, but I think it is like a Rorschach test. Um and a Rorschach test can be important because while the 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 ink blot may be meaningless, you're tapping into an understanding of yourself or surroundings because mm-hmm. of that meaninglessness of it. So those numbers might not actually mean something, but then that might have triggered subconscious thoughts in your wife where she was able to put a, a answers to another problem that you guys are having together. And it makes her think of things in, in a different way. So even these random things that aren't connected can have meaning if there's a thought behind it. And maybe that's also what I mean by we're in a thought driven universe. Yeah, you yeah know? no, definitely. Maybe, I don't know. <laughs> Well, I, I, like I said, I cannot wait for this book. Um, I know, like I said, well, like we said, it started on Subsec, but are we, is it going to continue to be serialized through that? Or now that you're doing it through Dark Horse, will the subsequent series just come directly to print? Um, no, I believe they're still going to come out through Substack, um, which is still a great way to experience them. Because first of all, you're getting James's whole thing, you know, um, everything that he's promoting behind the scenes of, of projects that are coming up. Um, the, the artwork, because you're looking at it on a screen is different than in print. Mm-hmm. Um, one of my favorite books, obviously is the Hellboy books. Um, and I prefer reading them physically, but when I'm looking at Dave Stewart's work on a computer, I'm seeing it the way that he's created it and they're more vibrant and there's more subtleties coming out. So, the, so despite the fact that, yeah, this is coming out to print, there's lots of reasons to still want to go over to, to Substack and to participate in that you get his discord and all the sort of behind the scenes stuff. Um, uh, so yeah, we're going to continue to do both as far as I know. Okay, cool. And then yeah. are there any other projects that you're working on that you can talk about? Yeah, we just announced um, uh, Project Monarch, which is like the 
insane cousin to Project Blue Book. So while Project Blue Book is trying to be very sort of uh, uh, journalistic and straightforward, Project Monarch is the opposite. And it is about conspiracy theories around Stanley Kubrick, uh, Stanley Kubrick's films, um, MK Ultra, uh, the Illuminati, and, and it's done as a satire on conspiracy theories. Um, and it's co-created by Victor Santos, who you know from his work like Polar, we worked mm -hmm. on, which became a television show on Netflix. And we worked on Mice Templar together with Brian Glass. Um, he's an amazing artist. So the two of us, we split the art chores. I'm doing the Stanley Kubrick parts. He's doing the parts that have to do with MK Ultra Assassin um, uh, pop movie stars. Um, so it's just really out there. Um, and uh, that'll be out in September as a graphic novel through Dark Horse Comics. Um, and if you go to my any of my promotional sites, my, my Twitter, my Instagram, you'll see me bombarding you with images of that. Oh man, that I mean, I'm I'm here for that. I love Kubrick, so I'm very very stoked to. And again, I don't necessarily believe in any of those theories, but I I love them, um, and I find them endlessly fascinating. Um, I actually I build the story more around the fictional Stanley Kubrick in here, uh, around his family and family dynamic than the specific uh, moon landing stuff and whatnot. Because a I don't want to get sued. Um, B, it has to be more than just conspiracy. You have to have like a heart to it. So there is this 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 family story in there, um, which is really twisted and, and screwed up. And um, I'm really afraid for when the book comes out because conspiracy theories have gone from uh, this sort of outside the box, anything goes, free thinking thing to a very kind of right wingy uh, insanity. It's kind of real world dangerous anymore. So like, A, I'm, a, I'm afraid of, who I'm attracting, B, I'm afraid of how I'll be presented, uh, uh, perceived, C, I'm being presented or afraid that I'm X, that I had to write a forward to this to make sure people understood that this was a satire because satire and irony is dead. You know, like I had to make sure that people knew I am not endorsing this. This is satire, right? <laughs> because yeah. it's an insane world anymore, you know? <laughs> it is a very insane world. Everybody has access to basically everything at all times of the day in their hand in their pocket you know in their i mean i know yeah. i spent a lot of hours in front of a screen you know and like it's just it's like second nature now so yeah i i know what you mean about the insanity of like yeah how crazy people can get but that book sounds so dope I love it's that a lot you of got, fun yeah i love that you got blue book coming out i'm excited for the stuff that hasn't been announced i can't wait for that stuff um before i let you go though i kind of want to ask you what are you currently reading what are you currently into that you want to give a little shout out to uh, you know, I don't get to read as much as I'd like to. Um, I'm rereading a lot of BPRD stuff. There's reasons for that. And I'll just say that. Um, so I'm rereading a lot of the, the BPRD work. Um, I'm actually having a lot of fun right now going back into old school. So this isn't comics, though. It's old school sword and sorcery stuff. Okay. So, uh, you know, uh, so I'm reading a lot of these like books from the 70s, you know, the, the Brack books or brand books, Brack. Um, there's a book called The Warrior Witch of Hell, uh, which is as pulpy and, and crazy as it sounds. Uh, that's a lot of fun. So I'm, I'm reading a lot of like old school um, uh, sword and sorcery stuff. <laughs> cool. Awesome, dude. Well, um, I'm, I want to thank you again. I had an absolute blast uh, talking comics with you. I definitely would love to do this with you again when we can talk some of your other projects that you are working on. And um, for everybody listening and watching, uh, if you want to just tell them where they can follow you, where they can like the Patreon, stuff like that. Um, and I'll drop all those links down below for you. Oh, thanks. Um, I'm pretty much at Oming everywhere. So at Oming on Instagram, at Oming and Twitter. Uh, for Patreon, it's what? Patreon.oming or slash Oming, something like that. Um, and I have a professional Facebook page. Uh, I think it's under Michael Avon Oming. Um, it'll be pretty clear whether it's my professional or my, my personal page. Um, my personal page, I just try and keep with people that I know or family. Um, but I do do a lot of interactions on the, the pro page. So come by there too. All right, cool. Well, again, thank you so much. And I can't wait to do this with you again sometime Thanks, in the future. Man. 